right. Welcome to Cut It Out. As far as I know, the only collage podcast on the planet. On today's show, I have Morgan Jesse Lapin here. We're going to talk about gigantic eight-foot-long collages, how to collage inside of a bubble coat, and how to create a collage, collect, a collage collective. And I'm sure we're going to talk about many more things. Hey, all right, Morgan. Hello, how are you? Good, man. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you for having me. Oh, wait, I forgot this. Hold on. Whoa. That was awesome. <laughs> Do you remember the thing from Nickelodeon? I forgot the guy from uh, Full House that did the cut it out thing. Um, Uncle Joey. I know. I always mess it, that up. Oh. You'd be like, cut yeah. it out. Yeah, my wife is a sucker for um, 90s sitcoms. So before Netflix, she had every single uh, episode on DVD of Full House. So yeah, so I've had a whole re-education in yeah. Full House and Fuller House. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of cutting, you've been doing an insane amount of cutting. Uh, All I do. I've seen recently that you're working on an eight foot long collage. And then before that, you must have spent many, many, many hours creating. Actually, I have a picture of it right here. Oh yeah. That big spherical. Is that all hair pieces from comic books? It's all hair pieces from comic books. And I, How did I collage? this is actually 40 inches in diameter, which is, a lot bigger than it actually sounds. It, it, I mean, most of the time goes into the cutting. Uh, putting it together goes a little bit quicker, but for this, it was kind of even. It was, uh, I should have sent you a picture of what it looks like on the other side because uh, just to, if, if people have ever heard me talk about collage, I, I don't use glue. Uh, I use uh, artist tape, archival friendly tape. Um, if I want to go backwards and make changes a little bit, you know, user friendly, I could do that. But you know, some of these pages are so old, there's no way uh, getting out of tearing them. But with collage, you could tape it back up. But yeah, this piece took, I would say maybe with cutting to putting it together, probably somewhere around like five months. Wow. With jumping around doing things like in between too. But yeah, that took a long time. That was. 40 inches is huge because what that's just shy of well, almost four feet, right? Because 48 inches is four feet. Right. And, right. and it's like a gigantic di circle dinner table, basically. Like that's I was am amazed when it was finished too. Not that I ever have enough money to like frame it. <laughs> There's no way. I don't even know. I'll have to figure it out. Custom framing is it's completely bananas. Oh, yeah. Now, so, um, well, I think you bring up something interesting um, about gluing. And um, you use tape. I use tape and glue stick. Um, some people swear by rubber cement. But some of the old timers in my uh, Facebook group, Collage Art Revolution, that have been making collages you know, since the 70s, they say all their stuff with rubber cement looks rubber awesome. Cement. I, I have a good friend... Uh that goes by the name of Pry in the Sky, <clears throat> great collage artist, local, uh, Brooklyn, also a musician. He plays in a band called Rubble Bucket. Um, oh, Rubble Bucket, dude. I know Rubble Bucket. Yeah, he's a trumpet player. Very, very good dude, like amazingly talented. He makes a collage a day, and he refuses to sell the originals. He refuses. Hmm. Uh, he just makes prints, but he uses rubber glue. I mean, rubber glue is, is a little bit forgiving, too, um, rubber glue that's different than rubber cement. Oh, sorry, rubber cement. Well, said I guess, I guess, yeah, but um, I have used it before, but yeah, once I went with tape, there was like no looking back after that. That was just like, and also a lot of my pieces, um, you know, if they're bigger, uh, a lot of the p I make big cities, and because I use tape and I'm not gluing everything down, there's a big city, like, like a piece like this. Um, if you saw it in the physical world, you would see like pieces leaning forward that give it depth and drop shadows. And, and it kind of allows you to go into the city. You're, you're able to like, it's more welcoming. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, it gives it depth. If I'm able to frame these, of course, with a space between the back of the piece itself and the glass, like a shadow box frame, you'll really see a lot of depth in, in the pieces that I make like this because I do use tape. On the bottom of the clips, I slide them under, I press them down, and I set them, and I keep on basically literally building upon the city. But it that gives sounds, it that depth. It sounds like the smart thing to do and also sounds uh, a really meticulous, particularly in like – like I'll use tape for – bigger stuff, almost like, almost like a pin or like a dry mount, right? Like I'll like really want something here. So I'll like, you know, I got it right here. Uh, it's supposed to be archival. It's just double-sided scotch tape. So I'll kind of pin a piece there and then I'll like glue the edges. But I could imagine when you're taping a bunch of really tiny things, like, are you, are you like, I don't even know how to describe it. Are you like I'm like cutting very tiny pieces of tape and I'll put like a, a stretch of tape on my cutting mat and then I'll cut the tape. I'll cut it to whatever size I if it needs to be like ridiculously microscopic, then I gotta cut it that small. I mean, yeah, that's the only way, or just cry and be like, I destroyed the clip, which would it's always a very painful thing when you you have a clip you love and you just you, you mess up, you cut the head off, you dizzy, you're like, oh no. But I actually have something right here in front of me. This is different tape that I use, actually. This is Scotch 924. And what this is, is very kind of interesting. I'm ready. I'm, I'm taking notes, sir. It's Scott. kind of like rubber glue. It's on a wax paper. It's kind of like, I guess it could be used for matting pieces. Mm -hmm. But it's a double-sided glue, so the glue is on this. And there's an art to, like, using it. I mean, I have a specific way. But there's a film on this wax paper. And I could show you right here. if you could, It's hard to see. But right there, you'll see the film lifting from that piece of wax paper. And now it's basically just, like, double-sided glue. But it, the texture, you could roll it up like... Uh, rubber cement it's almost like the same type but it comes on a wheel it's it's very interesting i'll, I'll usually just like cool. peel it back take a scissor like clip a tiny piece sometimes a piece will just the the stickiness will get stuck on my finger and then i'll just put my finger against the clip the clip will take the double-sided tape right off my my finger because my finger's oily and then just press it down but this stuff, I, I mean, I, I've never met anybody else that uses it. People, you know, there's scotch double-sided tape like you just showed before. Mm -hmm. But this, I think, might just be used for matting pieces, but it's called Scotch 924. And this is the only other type of, of tape that I use. And then do I have my archival? And then I, I basically it's just called artist tape, where it's just white tape. And that's the only two. And that's a double-sided tape. tape, too? No, that's not double-sided. Basically, what I'll do is I'll put the, the piece of tape on the clip, slide under, press down, like with those cities. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. So, I, okay, so I think I did see the back. Uh, so in the back of, like, the hair piece, you have, like, this patchwork of all these tiny You'll see, like, hundreds and hundreds of pieces. And I, like I said, each clip gets the piece of tape. I slide it in, I press it down, and that that's that's really it. You sell that big hair circle, that big hair piece? I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> um eventually man that is to me when i look at um these bigger pieces that you're doing people human beings no matter what language they're gonna see like the minutiae and they're gonna see the effort and then i i feel like your artwork also kind of has this like where's waldo quality where there's like so many things going on that it's, it's entertaining to kind of look and examine and like see what you could recognize and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, awesome. I uh, watched, watch this whole, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, I watched this whole show and I, I suggest anybody to watch this uh, series called genius, but there was one season that was um, uh, focused on Picasso and it was, I didn't, I, I didn't know much about Picasso before saying this, although he has a different, a very interesting relationship with the women. Yes. I love him. He loves, he loves having kids. <laughs> um, it was very inspiring. And then I, it, it's really made me think about my work because throughout the show, you see Picasso evolved. He jumped around. He went from, you know, normal painting, traditional. He went to collage, love collage, had the blue period, had all these different things. 
and it really made me think. I was like, you know, wow, it's it's so amazing. Like, no matter where he went, he was a master at it. And um, it really, I was like, you know, my work is very nostalgic. And I started to think about his work. I'm like, Picasso's work is, is timeless because, you know, a lot of his subjects is like love. Like some of the most famous songs that we listen to, love is like the number one topic through art and through music, you know? There's a billion songs about love. Yes. Um, and it's universal. So, you know, and I started thinking about my work and I, I was like, oh man, my stuff is really nostalgic because it's a small slice of time. Um, but it's it's the recipe, it's what made me, you know? And I started to think about it, it's like it's more almost like a time capsule is the style that I'm, I'm going for. But part of the reason that I started making bigger pieces is A, I have ADHD, which that's obvious. I do too, man. I didn't know you did. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> COVID made me realize I had it. I always had like an inkling, but once there were like fewer and fewer distractions, I'm like, shh, 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 shh. you know, so, all right. So yeah, that's I'm, why I'm listen, your most collage artist, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm sure. And let me ask you this with a lot, you know, you do a lot of interviews. Would you say that you find that a lot of people in the collage world do have ADHD? Hmm. I, that I'm, I'm not sure of. Maybe it's not, yeah, because it's not like people come out and they're like, I have ADHD. <laughs> you know, like some people don't feel comfortable about talking about it, but it was, it was, it did play a large role in my life having that. Mm -hmm. um, and collage is, is an amazing uh, therapy for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, if I it, wonder if artists in general kind of have it. Um, I think. Artists were the original people whose jobs were lost because of the industrial revolution. Like the past five years, it was like taxi cab drivers because of Uber. Like our shit, as soon as they could make like a dresser or a basket, like with a machine, like we were out. You know what I mean? That was a long right. time ago. Because we were, I think, the craftsmen and we were also the, um, the people that would make the icons and the symbols in our religions and stuff like that. So... I, I do see a common thread of like uh, mysticism, um, like psychedelic music for whatever reason. Like the fact that you mentioned like Rubble Bucket randomly. Um, I, I don't mean, know. Maybe I'll make uh, everyone on the show if they have ADHD. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I find that, you know, for the most part, whether they have ADHD or not, they find it to be a very big uh, therapy in their lives. Um, and, you know, I've done a lot of live. Uh, collage shows and people really get into it sometimes three hours is not enough at all like these people get into the zone and like oh we're closing up you know whatever and they're like no i'm not finished and you're like holy shit i'm sorry but like people you know we're making collages like in a workshop well or yeah just i'm like keep on making them damn collages and i'm gonna sign my name on the back no i'm just joking <laughs> no i would put on these like a uh, live collage events where people can come there's a bunch of like source material sure um, i used to work with uh, a company called excel mm -hmm. that makes like you know cutting tools mats and stuff like that and they would give me like free starter kits and i would hand them out to people you know to get them into collage you know, it sounds like I'm getting them into drugs. I'm like, yo, you ever tried collage before, man? <laughs> All the cool kids do it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I used to put these things on and people would come and they would really get into collage um, from people who have never made to, uh, collage before to people who have been making collage their whole lives. So um, obviously we couldn't have done that in the last few months, but yeah, hopefully. We used to do, I was doing workshops before um, – for COVID as well. And one of my uh, students, for lack of a better term, said, huh. I've never felt so relaxed and so anxious at the same time. Huh. Because you're like in the zone, yet you're worried about like cutting whatever you're working on in half or totally messing it up. Right. Or using the wrong clip when there's another better clip that exists somewhere. Um, and like, you know, I, I mean, I guess, you know what, I talk about evolving as an artist and I, I definitely did because when I first started, I didn't have that much material. So the options of clips was not as much as I give myself now. Now, you know, I became OCD. I, I cut out like I, uh, you know, a lot of folders full of pre-cut clips. I have probably thousands upon thousands of 
pre-cut clips, mostly buildings from color photography to black and white to black and white illustrated to color illustrated. Like, and, I, and then I have everything broken down in size, like one being the biggest houses. And then it breaks down to two, three, four, five. And then I even go up to seven folders of just different size because the way I make these cities is I'll start with the biggest ones because I like to show the depth and it will get smaller towards the top. So I have all these numbered folders like this. You'll see like, you know, Numbered folders. I see what you're getting at. You got you got yeah, you, tech going on. Yeah, right. You know, I'll get to. I mean, this one maybe had four stages, but I really started like breaking it down, even to like seven folders, for instance, just to get buildings that are so tiny that it just really gives the pieces depth. Um, let's, let's talk. I want to talk more about ephemera because. You were talking about like a sliver of time. Am I interrupting you? Because you were, you were. No, no, absolutely not. Because I'll go on forever. Please. Yeah. See you um, but noted, making file folders that show the size of the building. So when you assemble, you have this like, kind of like range of sizes. That's 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 wild, dude. Yeah. Um, you were talking about this like sliver of time, and one thing that kind of nags me when I'm trying to go to sleep at night is ephemera. I think in a long enough timeline is is going to disappear. Like the age, the age of print is is over with. Right. Months. Exactly. Particularly like cool looking stuff, right? Like I know when I open up a comic book now, sure there's cool artwork and stuff, but a, a lot of it just seems like it was made on like Procreate or whatever. Like the the colors of the old comics, the old um, ads and everything, they're so bright and chromatic and and silly. There's just there is this small window of time where stuff was printed and a lot of stuff was printed. And part of me wonders, I don't think collage is a dying art at all, but like is having this stuff just gonna go away in, in 30 years when I wanna make a collage, am I gonna be like, oh, this is my last Life Magazine I paid for? Yeah, I know, I know. Like One Life Magazine will be like 2000 Google droogs by that <laughs> point. You'll be like, I don't have 2,000 Google Drews. <laughs> I just bought a potato last week, and that yeah. potato was mad expensive. Didn't you know Google Drew spiked last week from uh, <laughs> yeah. 25 cents to uh, 10 million? Well, oh, that's a whole yeah. other thing. Like my, I have a manager, and like I do the NFT thing, of course, and like, you know, I I can like I kind of get it, but like when it comes to the whole thing with like buying gas, and then gas prices are going up. And then I'm just like, now there's this other cyber coin that's messing up this coin. And then Elon Musk just said he's autistic and now everything is ruined. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's the weirdest things that tilt the scales. Yeah, every, that's why I like, um, I think Ethereum is super <laughs> exciting and people are like, oh yeah, gas cost me whatever point, whatever Ethereum ends up being like $100. <laughs> and I'm like, that's cool to say you sold an NFT. But like, let's say for example, NFTs ran off of Bitcoin, and ten years ago you were like, I spent two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin uh, to mine my work, and I'm like, well, I would rather have that amount of Bitcoin right now. You know what I'm saying? Like the value of it. But, and I'm gonna eat my, I'm probably gonna eat my words. The only way I could think of probably affording more Ethereum is if I make an NFT and sell it because you get Ethereum for it, right? Right. Ethereum. And Ethereum is usually going, I mean, it's like up and down and up and down, but I think it will usually keep on going up. I mean, I, again, I I'm lucky that I have someone that's assisting me with this because otherwise. You what, please tell me more about your manager. Like, how did you, how did you get one? What, how do you work together um, from an ADHD brother to, to, to you? <laughs> Right. I'm sure having someone to be like, dude, do this, stop, you know, counting broccoli heads, you know, right here. Like, it's got to be very helpful. Tell me more. Right. Like, how did you find this person? What, what's going on with your manager? You're hundred percent correct. Um, and it happened by chance because for years, you know, I, I play music. I do this, I do that. And people are like, you just need a manager. And I'm like, you know, somebody, like, okay, then, then, all right. And I, years and years, constantly hearing this, like, okay. Well, uh, one day I met somebody, we were doing a show 
um, at this uh, CBD shop in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And he really believed in my work. It started off that way. It, it didn't start. It started off as a friendship. He was an admirer of my work, and, I, and it really meant a lot to me. And he was serious about how he really liked my work and wanted to support me. And um, it turned out that he did have a business degree, and he is a very sharp guy. We grew up in the same area, upstate New York and Rockland County, uh, County area, which is basically like I. It's like one hour from where I'm at now, which is Bushwick, Brooklyn. Mm. And we see eye to eye on a lot of things. And he was able to, the first, well, the reason that he became my manager is he had a situation where he's able to negotiate a business deal for me. And he crushed it. He crushed it. And we both were like, wow, what you just, we were both, he's like, I can't believe I just did that. I'm like, I can't believe you just did that. That's yeah. crazy. And um, since he really believed in my work and he supported me even before he was my, my manager, um, we went into business together, and that's when we opened up Trigonal Gallery, which right now is is online through Artsy. Um, but you know, the whole online gallery game is a very difficult one um, from someone who's been curating physical shows for sure. a long time. Uh, probably, well, since uh, well, I want to hear more about um, I want to hear more about uh, a gallery. But I wanted to ask you uh, one question because I think a lot of people listening might not know like how a manager works. For example, I did it till my friend got one. Like he barely posts on social media, but uh, he really has gets great accounts because he got a manager. And what I realized is his manager gets paid when he does, right? So if the manager, I don't know if this is what your situation is, but if the manager finds work. It's a percentage. It's a percentage. percentage. Of yeah. Right. So like my buddy paints um, cleats and ice skates for professional athletes in the Buffalo area. Right. Okay. He's not, you know, going on Instagram all the time. You know, he's not, you know, podcasting, like trying to let people know, hey, I'm doing stuff. He's got a manager and, you know, he's, you know, painting people's mugs on their own. <laughs> their own cleats he's painting i feel like you know once you get locked in with a job like that you're good to go because it's such a specialized unique niche that it doesn't sound like i've never heard of that in my life so obviously if, if you're good at it and they need you <laughs> that's a person but what you know we're first of all and as you know this um collage is probably the least respected uh artistic medium uh, it's a newer medium compared to most other ones, uh, from uh, photography to painting to everything else. Sure. But there's still a respect level. I, I worked in the world of interior design for uh, close to about 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been to all the Art Miami, Miami Fairs, Art Basel, Scope, Pulse, this, that, the other thing. Sure. Yeah, and I can, I can definitely tell you, you know, over the years, you really don't see too many galleries supporting collage. Very rarely. Like if I saw one, I was like, holy cow, you guys have collage. Even like the last time I went to Miami was a bunch of years ago. But even going to some of the fairs in New York City, I say the ratio is like, seriously, like <sighs> right now, maybe five to 30 booths, five to 30, like, yeah, like five out of 30 booths, I would say will support collage very rarely. Hmm. Tough. It is so tough. Here's, it is. And that's part of the reason why I started making bigger pieces, uh, being involved in interior design projects. You know, there's a lot of money in interior design within par apartments that have a lot of wall space. They want to fill that wall space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started taking my collages bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, not only because I'm interested in embarking on that adventure to make something absolutely ridiculous, and I like to beat myself out each time. Like I, making this collage eight feet wide by, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to stay that width, but eventually I, I'm hoping, I'm, I think I'm going to hit six feet tall. Talking about frames, yeah, whoever buys that is going to have to buy the frame because any piece at eight feet by, first of all, to transport, forget about just like the framing. But let's say you, you have a piece that's literally eight feet by six feet. That's a heavy piece. First of all, you better make sure that thing can fit outside your door. 
or sure. throw it down the stairs if you're in an apartment. Like that's how crazy. I haven't even thought about those things. I'm just saying that now. I'm like, I better be able to. I'm wondering if you could use your interior design skills to basically create like a like a rendering and a proposal of the frame and the cost. So when you're like, hey, this is your eight foot thing. I got this guy. He's gonna frame it, you know, with UV protected plexi, whatever. It's gonna look great. This is exactly what it's gonna look like. You you know, you know, render it or go on Fiverr, pay someone to render it for you, whatever. This is exactly what it's gonna look like. This is the cost. You could kind of almost like put that as a proposal in it, you know. <clears throat> yeah, you're right. No, that should you're right. That that could talk to my manager. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you're right though. I mean, listen, if that piece sells, I gotta have a backup on on like this is the steps moving forward because I don't have it framed right now. And if you want this piece, then the frame is part of it. And you know, you want to make it easy as, as possible for the person to buy it. You know, you want to have all the answers immediately, obviously. When they know why they buy. Right. Uh, but it's, it, it's tough. You know, I started the Brooklyn Collage Collective in uh, 2013. Um, right now. So it, what is the Brooklyn Collage Collective? It's been through a lot of evolutions. That's mm -hmm. for sure, because it's been around since 2013. A lot of people have moved. Things have happened, moved on, stopped doing collage for whatever reason or just. You know, so right now it is basically working in tandem with Trigonal Gallery because a lot of shows that we're going to do involve collage. Once I open up the gallery, it's going to be a lot of collage stuff going on. So right now it's it's me and a few other people, but um, we have a lot of big plans. Keeping it on the wraps, secrets, but we're definitely doing a lot more with it once we get the gallery going. And this last show, we, we were able to feature a lot of great collage artists. So with a trigonal gallery, you just had a show, and that was an online right. show. That was an online show through Artsy. And so we did the Zoom. We put it live through Facebook, Twitch. I forgot what program. It, like, broadcasts to everything at once. Okay. I forgot. Um, YouTube, everything like that. So, yeah, we were able to have all the artists on. Uh, people were asking questions throughout the show. Um, it was a success. It was great. Everyone had a good time. Made some sales, so nice. Yeah, yeah, but I'm more excited for the physical galleries moving forward. I mean, obviously, there's a big difference, you know. Sure. Well, you're in general to me from you know following you on various social media accounts. You're you to me. You're kind of just trying to elevate collage in general. You you have thank you. That means a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. For you're staying. promoting the entire the entire art. And I, and I and I and I do think the the medium needs that. You know, I I'll, when I, I say it all the time when I say I make collages, people think I'm like a scrapbooker or something like that. You know, they don't really understand. I could I could tell you uh, what was very interesting about doing these live collage events because at the time there was a very big crew of <clears throat> people involved in the uh, Brooklyn Collage Collective, and there were a lot of people that did not want to be part of those live collage shows a lot of people thought that it's kind of like turning it into arts and craft time or showing the uh, the magic behind the door they don't want people to see what publications they use they don't want them to see how their their style is seriously that a lot of people really were like i can't be a part of this i don't know why you do it and then i had a whole bunch of people well this is turning people on that didn't know collage into collage artists it's it's informing people it's getting people into the art so you had a very different uh, perspective on, on both ends. Some people thought it was downing it. Other people thought that it was a complete opposite. Interesting. And it's, yeah. It's, it's, and, I, and I, you know, I could see both point of view. So I can't even choose, like, what is it? Is it downgrading the uh, art itself? And I think that it's just, it's going to be an opinion that someone's going to have. Yeah. Because it's A or B, you know what I mean? It's it's one or the other. I but mean, to me, it's like it's like why why do you learn to play an instrument? Like I played the trumpet through up through middle school. I sucked at it, but when I got older, I saw this guy he calls himself Brown Man. He's from Toronto. He was a physics. He was a physics guy. What do you call a physics? Not a physician. He's a physics physics dude. He's got an Xbox tattoo on his neck. <laughs> He's Trinidadian. He lives in Toronto. This guy started playing the trumpet in front of me. I was completely mind blown. Now, if I never played the trumpet in my life, I probably never would have been 
able to have been absolutely mind blown by this guy's skill, right? right? So to me, when you're showing people how to make artwork, you're at least giving them a hint at how difficult it is or how fun it is. To me, that's just going to help the overall appreciation of the craft. You see what I'm saying? Right. right. I think so, it comes down to personality. That's that's what it is. Some people are secretive. They, you know, like I want to inform people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a time and a place, but it, it was interesting, uh, you know, seeing the social aspects of how people feel about the same event. It was very interesting. But you don't realize these things until you do it. I guess I've always been somewhat of a art zealot or evangelist in a way, because I, I just think it's good for people, good for people to to make art. And like as you said, OK, yeah, it's a it's a personality thing, you know. So I'm happy to teach collage workshops. I'm I love it, man. I'm and I'm happy you're I'm happy you're doing this work uh, down in Brooklyn, and um, seeing the Brooklyn Collage um, Collective and has kind of had me thinking. You know, there's a handful of decent collage artists in Buffalo. You know, uh, Control X, Control V's from here. Right. Uh, right. Um, uh, there's a few others uh, whose names elude me right now. One one cat just like collaged a whole bunch of skateboards, but like the, his collage graphic was on it. I was like, dude, that's sick. I want to hang out with that guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, um, now you have a Skillshare class, don't you? And that's teaching people collage. Yes. That, that, that was an that? amazing chance situation. Um, someone uh, reached out to me that was uh, part of Skillshare and they happened to be close to where I live. So I, I had an amazing opportunity that a lot of people that, have classes on Skillshare didn't have, which was uh, I worked with somebody that, again, he lived right next to me, so they were able to do a great job of filming my class. A lot of people filmed it. Film. I didn't see the whole thing, but I saw like your intro video. I'm like, it, it's an amazing job. I mean, he rocked it. They made it look absolutely magical. I couldn't stop laughing my ass off. I was like, this is, <laughs> just looking at myself, I was like, it's killing me. Um, so yeah, no, it was an amazing opportunity, and um, it took off very quickly. Um, I still push it, and people enjoy it. It's something that you can go back to and learn, you know, small tips and things like that. But my second video, I will have to do my uh, on my own, editing, filming, and everything like that. So, you know, that is, and, and anybody who has done that, that's a big undertaking, and that's like, you know, and right now it's crazy because uh, I'm stretched out pretty. Been uh, you know working, doing the online gallery, promoting the NFTs because really, to most people, people dealing with NFTs that's a full time job. That is a full time job because, um, you know, it's really tough to sell NFTs because it's such a small niche. It really is, and uh, it's really about going on Discord and Clubhouse and uh, promoting yourself in these chats. From what I understand, um, that's the last thing that I have yet to to have done. Um, but it's tough, you know, and also on Instagram, it's it's really difficult. I tag everything, and I did get the attention of, like, Mark Cuban's NFT uh, company, and they reposted my stuff. And even then, it's it's still really difficult because there is a big uh, disconnect between the art world and the NFT world. And, of course, it is very difficult to understand. you got to have a meta wallet. you got to have this. you got to have that. And so a lot of people who don't really have the time to understand it hate it very against it. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. Um, again, I'm very lucky in the fact that I have someone assisting me in the NFTs. Otherwise, there's no way that I would have any NFTs. Uh, I, I it's, it's a lot to take in. So I can understand people's frustration and, and uh, feeling of rebellion against it. I think I, I, I think NF, NFTs are the future. And I think it's, I don't think we quite understand what it's going to be. Like I remember uh, watching like network news once and they were like the Apple announced that they're making something called the app store and it's going to be all these games and gizmos you could download on your phone. And Apple claims it's going to be a whatever billion dollar industry. And then I remember the anchors being like, are people really going to spend a billion dollars on uh, candy crush, you know, whatever. And I'm like, um, I don't know. Are they? And then that's Uber. That's Grubhub. That's every single app that's like replaced everything was in that little doinky doink app store. So NF, 
NFTs is wild. Uh, it's interesting that you, you say that. that. It's really interesting. My my manager would agree. Basically, he so there's different platforms for NFTs. There's like uh, Rarible, Open Seas, this and that. We're we're on Open Seas because you don't have once you open up an account, I don't think you have to pay anymore to upload an NFT. You can just keep on doing on Rarible. I think it's per NFT you have to pay. Still don't know too much about it, so I can't answer too many questions. But he feels that Open Sea is like basically the next uh, Amazon. That's that's what he keeps on telling me. Interesting. It's going to be the next Amazon. He was in the early. It's going to be a marketplace for, for uh, an Amazon for digital assets, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it's hard for me to explain, but he's been around, you know, doing HTML in the beginning of like you know Internet 1.0. So he feels that this is basically the next evolution of the Internet, and that Open Seas with NFTs and cryptocurrency is basically going to be the next Amazon, because anything could be an NFT. Anything could be an NFT. And Even NFT um, could have all these instructions. Yeah, I, the acts that all these things get. Oops, all these things could happen. Like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk was just saying, like sooner or later, like every concert ticket. My manager be- loves that guy. Oh, uh, he love he brings Gary him up right. all the time, man. He listens yep. to him constantly. Yeah, Gary. I I had to take Gary V breaks because I I I always want to do like ten like every like I always want to do like ten more projects, you know. But uh, Gary Gary V is fantastic, but the the ADD like gets hijacked sometimes, you know, <laughs> like listening to all these uh, wonderful ideas. Now, um, I understand that though. People ask me, so you're in, you got NFTs going on. You're making these like huge pieces with you know like New York City apartment walls in mind. Um, one gig that you got that was super cool is this over here. You. Um, as far uh, if you have a collage coat, who did you partner up with to do this? So I worked with a company called The Very Warm. Um, our first run was in what was it, uh, 2017, I believe. Um, and it was picked up by Nordstrom's and sold out. And then the next season came close to rolling out. And yes. then all of a sudden – Everything fell through because they changed branding direction. Oh, man. Completely different than like having artwork involved in any of these these pieces, which was a real shame because to sell out through Nordstrom first uh, try and then deviate from that was very interesting. But that's that's exactly what happened. So uh, for those that are just listening, it's like a really cool like leather colored or like uh, yeah. bubble jacket with like a sepia cyan, like black and white. Well, it comes in blue. It comes in this color and it com- it, it went in black. And then there was a different style altogether. But um, and I don't even usually wear these type of jackets. It is the warmest jacket. It is ridiculous. Like I, I don't even know. I can go to the freaking South Pole in this thing and roll around and be fine. So you so you you rock your collage coat. Oh yeah, I love it. That's awesome. I mean, I'm biased, but yeah. Did your manager help you get that gig, or how did that come about? Because a lot yeah. of people ask me, how do you get clients and stuff? You like know, that? you know, you play uh, RPGs, right? You ever um, play Final Fantasy? I I was really into StarCraft recently, into Fortnite, um, and a lot of. Men- Magic the Gathering, so not too much RPG. Basically, you know, even in like Dungeons and Dragons, you walk around the town, you got to talk to everybody, you got to find out everything. Yeah. Same thing. You just got to talk to everybody. You just got to make friends. You got to make alliances. You know, you, you, you hook people up, you take care of people, you scratch their backs, they'll scratch yours, and you just got to be receptive and open to different so ideas. If I, a, if I see a bugbear, I'll be like, hey, got any coat deals? Got, yeah, you got any uh, labels? You got any uh, anyone who needs a business card made? You just got to throw <laughs> it out there. You got. I mean, listen. Sure. When I was working in the interior design world, I worked in an office. I was on site and in the office and back and forth. Then any downtime that I ever had, I was constantly promoting my work through Tumblr, through any way possible. Didn't make make a difference. I'm still on Flickr through uh, Yahoo. I don't even think they're connected anymore, but I still use Flickr. Like you got to really fight to get your stuff seen and there's a lot of people out there and you know you gotta 
you know, I, um, I feel like collage is a very competitive medium because it is a newer medium. So everyone's always like, oh, the person did this. And like, I get the mentality because I'm, I'm the same way. I just made a collage on the top of a freaking nail. I'm like, if I, don't do this, if I don't do this soon, I'm going to wake up the next day. And the first thing I'm going to see is some 16 year old kid in France made a damn collage on a nail. And I'll be like, yeah. so I did it. I did it quickly. I said, do it, Morgan. It's some 16 year old kid, some three year old kid from the moon. That's a great promotional thing. You could think of all the silly way, like silly places or ways you could collage. Like I've seen some wild the first collage ever made in the the deep sea floor of the Bering Strait. Right, 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 right. I like that. I like that. You better go do it tomorrow. And this, yeah. The more awkward the subject matter is, you know, you're gonna like. I don't think I've seen like any accident do on like a bunch of yellow desserts or something. Yeah. I'm gonna hang myself upside down next week. And I'm gonna make a collage, like a like a David Blaine stuff. <laughs> or I, I used to have an inversion machine. I gave it to my neighbor. He'll let me borrow it again. You know the inversion <laughs> machine, right? To decompress your back. Yeah, you like flip upside down. You know, collage <laughs> like a like a like Rocky training. Like. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it upside down. <laughs> but dude, I I think it's. I real. haven't seen it. <laughs> I did. I haven't seen it either, man. The um, I'll do my upside down and you'll do under the sea. Okay, I'll do under the sea. I can't do heights. I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm scared of heights. Um, one thing I wanted to start making was was my own my own magic eyes because I realized I like using like ma like the magic eye books. And I've been meaning oh, to. Make, uh, right. I want to make my own uh, magic eyes, which is not a first. Maybe. You can, I, I don't. I don't think it's like. I don't think I've seen anybody but you do it. I, just, I remember it, when they first came out. I mean, it was like you know, my dad was like, "You're not gonna believe." My dad is a Jew from the Bronx. So he was like, uh, he was home. He's like, "You're not gonna believe this thing that I just got. You could <laughs> see these spaceships if you cross your eyes." And of course, you know, you have the people that can't do it, just staring <laughs> at it. They're like, like really getting physically like angry and aggressive. Uh, people start cursing like. Fuck you! I didn't see shit. You ever see the Seinfeld episode? It was like a Seinfeld episode where the old man can't see it and Elaine sees it, but he's like, "That was true in Mallrats too, I think, right?" It, oh, uh, Mallrats. Yeah. They're like, "It's a schooner." He's like, "Ha ha ha! It's a sailboat." <laughs> it's a sailboat. Oh, dude, they took the malls by storm. Like they, there was like stores of just magic eyes, like framed in like a gold frame. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The mall. Remember the mall? Holy cow! I was just at the mall. It was not pretty, dude. It was like, it was like, if everybody from The Walking Dead was well dressed. Yeah, it's scary. The mall. I haven't been to one in a very long time. I mean, in New York, in New York, that's what we had. I mean, everywhere, but New York is. I love the mall. I Middle Town Fields, Galleria. Fields right now. Yeah, we had it. That's where I was. I was at the Walton Galleria. Stopped in to get something for Mother's Day, <laughs> and um, there were gigantic swaths, basically just closed up. There was just nothing. I didn't there. get to that point. I, I never seen it in its most depressed state. I went and, and Hot Topic was still open. Oh, so did you, let me guess, you were getting a pumpkin a pair of pajama pants and a, a rhinestone belt. My roommate used to work there. She was from <laughs> island. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I'll tell you, man, people like to knock on it, man. But you know, this I got is really embarrassing. I actually took a, it was a phone call, uh, thing for Hot Topic to get hired. So I had to call this number, and they like ask you all these questions. Okay. You know, the question. All of a sudden, they're like, someone has just purchased two hundred and fifty-six dollars worth of merchandise, but item A is on sale for twenty-five percent off item b and i'm like holy shit i don't know man like what the i'm like scrambling looking for a calculator and like you have 10 seconds to answer this question i'm like oh my god i'm gonna fail the hot topic <laughs> oh, and I fail. They're like sorry you you like you can reapply in six months i'm like oh dude <laughs> I just failed the hot topic anyway. exam, dude. Sad, man. Sad. So they wait a second. 
<laughs> ear sings there, so you could, can you just answer some math questions and just start stabbing earlobes? Or do they not do piercings at Hot Top? I guess as long as you know how to sell things that are on sale, you're good as gold. You can yeah. be the uh, I'm going to start paying more attention to sublime t-shirt prices in case I need Right, to right, right. I remember I got a Mindless Self-Indulgence album there once. Mindless self and um They're a little bit of a crazy band. I don't remember Mindless Self. I remember the name. I can't. What was their hit? Was it, what was their? I don't think they really had any hits. <laughs> but I can tell you that the lead singer drinks his own. Oh well, you need the nutrients. You know. Yeah, his name is Jim. Jesus. Oh yeah, they put on a show, man. Look him up. I've never <laughs> put it this way. I don't think I can really think of a band. Your oh, moments from Mindless Self Indulgence. Indulgence. MSI. <laughs> You'll love it. What have you been listening to lately? Um, what have I been listening to lately? Um, I could tell you actually. Let's see. Uh, Corridor mm -hmm. from Montreal. Really, really cool stuff. Really been into them. Um, I jumped back recently to a band called Stove. Interesting name, but they're they're based out of uh, Brooklyn. And you're a musician as well, right? Yeah, I I play music. So what do you play? Well, not live anymore, but um, I play guitar, drums, and bass. What kind of style of uh, what kind of style of music do you like to play? Well, my dad brought me up. The first band that I could ever remember is uh, Frank Zappa, and after that, it was the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, and the Beach Boys, and lots of Steely Dan. There's a big Very dilemma great. about my big leg, Emma. Uh huh. I love Zap. Oh, yeah, dude, dude Zap is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I listen to everything, everything, everything. I, I'm, I'm a constant search for finding new music. And there's a lot of good music out there. Actually, another band I just found called Drug Cabin. Mm -hmm. But it's a guy from a band called Pretty Girls Make Graves, which I never really listened to. And another band called Ambulance LTD that had like one album in like 2004. And it's just like very chill, laid back. Like the album is called Yard Work. It sounds right. exactly like what you would like pick. It's just really beautiful slide guitar, simple songs, super catchy hooks. Can't really argue with it. It's, not, it's, it's good music to work with when you're making collage, for sure. That's awesome, dude. That's great. I've been really into some surprisingly like heavier stuff. My buddy got me into the OCs. Oh, the OCs are amazing, man! So Holy awesome. cow! It's there's there's not too many bands on that. Angry, man. like I, I love it, and um, so that got me into like Ty Siegel, right? And um, who are those boys from uh, Australia? Uh, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. They're all great. You would probably like uh, Porn Crumpets. I don't know if you ever heard. Yeah, of I was them. listening to the, the, the psychedelic Porn Crumpets. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're badass. They're badass. They're from they're, uh, so Max yeah, Malone. Yeah. He was Max Malone was my first guest on the show. He's from from Australia, and I was like, "What's going on with Australia? You guys have Tame Impala, psychedelic Porn Crumpets, Bay Rainbow." Can I say a bad word. What's that? Can I say a bad word. Sure. There's a band actually from Melbourne called uh, Tropical Dawn. You ever heard of them? Um, no, but it sounds uh, entertaining. They are awesome. <laughs> uh, it's just like really good, like kind of like, I don't even know. They're amazing. Uh, yeah, Tropical Fox Storm from Melbourne. They've been around for a few years. I think they used to be called the Drones, but really like artsy videos. Check out the videos are absolutely insane. They're great. Yeah. Really cool, colorful vibes coming from that continent right now, huh? Yeah, no, they, I mean, listen, uh, don't forget Silverchair. <laughs> nice dude Vans warp tour 97 let's go Where was that? I, that's when i graduated high school nice yeah okay. so i want to ask you um i like to ask all of uh my guests before we tie up the show um what uh is there anything you got working on now that you want to tell people about where could people where could people find you uh, anything you want to plug to let people know um, about uh, whatever you got going on right now? You can find me in my room in Brooklyn, the room that I don't leave. Um, <laughs> well, I'm working on uh, helping run Trigonal Gallery, where we're trying to support a lot of fresh new artists like uh, Groovecraft. Alex, he's an amazing talent. I mean, uh, he, I love the guy. 
and you too, you're more than welcome to come down. I, I, I mean, when things I'd are to. and there, there's nothing more that I would love to have like a crazy collage show with everybody. And um, years ago, I experienced something uh, through collage. They had something called the World Collage Day Summit in New Orleans. And I think this was 97, the first one that they did. And one year got rained out because New Orleans got hit with like a huge hurricane. But they usually do it every year. And uh, I went the first year and I was able to meet people that I only knew through Instagram and Tumblr and things for years, just cool. talking to them online. Like uh, Kike from Peru that uh, goes by the name uh, Canson City. Canson City, yeah. Right, and he runs a collage wave, which a lot of people are are probably in the collage world familiar with, collage wave. Did he come, he came all the way to New Orleans? Came to New Orleans, and uh, he was like a brother from another mother, man. As soon as I met him, like we were like – they're like, ah, so, oh, I've known you for my whole life. That's you know, It was great. And I met a lot of really great people. Zach Collins. What's that uh, event called? It was, it was through a magazine called Collage. Mm -hmm. uh, K-O-L-A-J. Um, and they have a pretty big community. I mean, it's, it's probably the most recognized collage magazine out there at this moment. Um, you want to make a magazine? <laughs> no. I'm gay. Yeah, no. No, Never. I I had to stop myself because I um wanted to make um a magazine called the Wamboozler. Uh, <laughs> That's a great name. And I actually wanted this to be <laughs> the cover. I wanted this to be the cover. It's a great shirt, though. That's a great shirt. And yeah. and, and so you sell those on your site, or what do you? Um, I don't. This. I'm going to this one isn't up yet. I got a lot of pr I got this as a print up there. Yeah, no, that's um, but I've been meaning to I've been meaning to put this up. But. My dad was a, a guy with the eye. Loved the eyes. Had the like the old rings with the like realistic looking eyeball and stuff. Like had a watch with a hologram with an eye. Just love. He's like the seeing eye, the third eye. Like he, he just loves that whole like he did in the seventies. So. <laughs> I was like, and he told me this. Like, dad oh, grew up, you got you grew up with Frank Zappa, and your dad had like a eye signet ring on. Yeah, my dad, true <laughs> hippie, crazy. He once told me he drove from New York to California on um. I've never right. done anything like that, but yeah, it sounds like a little, uh, a little risky. Uh, risky. He yeah. lived. He's very content, and I've never met a, a human more content. Doesn't need I anything. What's that like? Well, he needs he needs in New York teams like Yankees, Knicks. As long as he's got his New York teams and his, he's a hundred and ten percent. Nothing will bother this man, <laughs> and that's all he needs. That's it. That's all he needs. Like seriously, that's it. Okay, food and the toilet. I grew up in a Yankees house uh, myself. Oh man, your parents must be a lot of Don Mattingly then. <laughs> I, I just my. My 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 grandfather lived to ninety seven, and he was watching those Yankee games. Oh no shit! Right to the right to his deathbed. Yeah, it was like the Yankee. My dad, my my own father was like, yeah, the Yanks kept him going a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yo, there was. I'll tell you, this is insane. So, as we all know, people who watch baseball, an average game could be up to like three hours long, anywhere from two and change to like three hours long. It was one time where my dad watched a doubleheader where the Yankees went against. I I forgot what team. And it was a double. It was a double header. So it was like six hours, right? Fast forward later in the day, I talked to him like late in the night because the guy doesn't sleep. I'm like, "What's up?" He's like, "Watching a double header again." I was like, "Come on, man!" He's like, "I'm like that means that you spent twelve hours today watching the double header and a rerun of a double header. You got to be sick." He, a rerun of the, he didn't just watch another doubleheader. He watched a rerun of the doubleheader. He watched a rerun of the doubleheader. He's like, why wouldn't I? It was a great game.